Welcome to Lecture 5 in Innovation and Commercialization. Lecture 5 is the, we're going to discuss the generic nature of our innovation elements and also the interaction between them. As we mentioned several times, it's difficult for us to even think about making uh, the map for just the market um, elements or just the technology elements with actually uh, without thinking about the other elements involved. That natural tendency is because that's what you need in order to um, think about innovation. And so here we're gonna make this a little bit clearer by first of all, setting the stage that the market technology imp implementation elements that we've discussed are generic in any sense, that even, we, even though we use the pen and physical examples to uh, elucidate what they are, uh, we just want to make sure that the general nature of those elements is, is clear to you. Then uh, we're going to talk about that interaction of the elements and at the end of that it will reveal essentially the human process of innovating at whatever stage from incremental all the way to fundamental. This is lecture 5.1 uh, where we uh, discuss the generic innovation and interaction of of innovation elements and we're going to start with the generic nature of the elements. In this lecture we want to get across that even though we've been using the simple writing pen analogy we want to show you that the how the concept is quite general and that um, you know there's always an, um, a disadvantage of using such a simple analogy in that um, it tends to not show the generic nature. You know on the one hand it's very practical on the other hand uh, you cannot see how it's really kind of a generic representation of market implement, implementation and technology. And so the objective of part of this lecture, Lecture 5.1, is to um, show you that. So let's begin that uh, process. Uh, we currently tend to categorize innovation within a very specific subfield. And indeed, because that's easier to understand, that's why we started with the pen analogy. However, we want to broaden it today and show you that uh, actually this is very closely related in a very generic way on how humans do the innovation process. And so even though we have that very specific example, we want to get beyond the traditional thing that we tend to look at hardware innovation or software innovation. And we, we kind of look at these things in separate categories. And it's very important if we're going to understand um, how to innovate in any field, uh, which uh, for people that are gaining information about innovation through this class or other means, presumably you want to be able to innovate on a broad scale. You want to have your uh, the ability to update your information and learning as you go along, and, and you can innovate in other fields. You don't have to stick to that subfield. And so it's very important to kind of get to this uh, generic element. Um, uh, yeah, so this is this is one of the the big jumps we're trying to make here is that um, people tend to pigeonhole innovation because they're not really focusing on the elements like like we have so far. Another aspect of innovation besides you know getting pigeonholed into these into these subfields and thinking that it runs differently in each case. Uh, another problem is people argue well how big an innovation is. And so, you know, we get into this language of, um, you know, sort of, uh, oh, that's a very small change, and so it's incremental, and then, oh, wow, that's a much bigger one, it's fundamental. And it's kind of used in a very loose way, and so we want to get beyond that language. We want to kind of understand what's going on. Now, for those of you familiar with Christensen's work, uh, this sort of incremental fundamental approach is the same thing as the language that he used, which is sustaining so he used uh, this language that uh, is called uh, um, sustaining and disruptive, where uh, incremental, you know, small little innovations are the ones that are sustaining because incremental is sort of from an innovation perspective, you know, a small jump, but sustaining is from the effect of that innovation. So in other words, small little jumps sustain um, uh, the progress of the current roadmap that you're on. 
So little increments, you know, the market's the same, the implementation's the same, maybe I do a little technology difference, or vice versa, you know, uh, everything else is the same, and I make, I slightly change to a, a slightly different uh, sub, sub uh, market, uh, um, you know, a, a different TAM, you know, total addressable market, a very small one. So these very small changes where I get another product out or another uh, increment on the innovation uh, sustains the way things are. Where fundamental is much more disruptive, uh, it's, its effect is that it causes a huge change in the way things are done in general across a particular industry. And so um, Christensen uh, from the Innovator's Dilemma uh, has used the term uh, sustaining and disruptive to describe essentially which, uh, which are um, here uh, we would classify as incremental and fundamental. What we're going to show you is that um, even these ways of looking at it, you know, we've argued that the hardware, software, process, biomedical, you know, that there's a generalization now that we have to find these elements of market technology implementation that we can go up and look at all those things in common. And we're saying the same thing here that it's really not just two extremes of uh, incremental and fundamental, but in fact, there's a whole spectrum of, of in between these two. And so hopefully we'll, through some examples in this class, be able to show you how um, there's a full spectrum. It's not really just a choice of, of two things, very, very incremental or drastically fundamental. Examples of uh, incremental innovation, uh, small changes for yet, you know, um, an, um, uh, uh, another version of something. Here is the classic case of a mousetrap. And so in this case, you know, market and implementation are really, you know, more or less the same, but a slight change in technology, you know, which is the, you know, literally the classic, you know, just another mousetrap, but it is different. And you can see here that, you know, if I had a cute little uh, mouse, oops, gotta go forward and have to, oh, come on. There we go. If I had a cute little, you know, mouse here, this is my attempt at drawing. And he sees a cheese, or he or she sees a cheese, comes over here, and then of course it would um, unbalance the lever arm and fall in, and then because of the size of the uh, jump here, they wouldn't be able to um, go back out and so you trap the mouse. So that's a, of course, a, a very uh, simple way. If you had to pick a more definition of incremental than that, it would be yet another mouse trap. In the textbook, uh, Inside Real Innovation, we uh, look at another example. And, and I think this example is very revealing because people tend to not look at innovation as generic way and they kind of look at it as more of some sort of you know magic or something and um, I wanted to go back and show you that um, this example in the book that the uh, restaurant example which people tend to you know uh, those of you not familiar you know the restaurant is prob is the um, business in the United States which has the highest rate of failure uh, but within this context, we keep track and say, look, um, let's use our model, which is, I'm arguing, completely generic uh, in this context, and it's important to think this way. So, you know, let's say that the um, application is the same, you know, where we're looking at a very particular uh, piece of the restaurant business, so a sub-market that we're, um, you know, supplying into. And what we've done is, let's suppose that now we've taken these uh, tables, and arrange them uh, in a way so that uh, we have space between the bar, recognizing that our current implementation, uh, which is that our business model requires customers to be able to have clear access to the bar because alcoholic drinks have a higher margin on it. And so our particular implementation is such that uh, we require a lot of uh, alcoholic beverages to be sold in order to make margin. And so the ability to arrange these tables uh, into a particular way, that algorithm in my head that I use to change this and it boosts uh, revenue and profit, 
are indeed uh, technology. So there's a tendency to think of such humble, um, such humble uh, um, physical and technical thoughts, uh, physical things and technical thoughts, to be um, not worthy of innovation. And remember, we're leaving the sort of worthiness, which you know, size of the innovation, to this other discussion of of incremental to fundamental. Here, we're saying, look, every innovation has these three elements. And so um, here, technology is the algorithm of how to arrange the tables, which produces, you know, better outcome is indeed part of the uh, technology landscape. And of course, remember we talk about old and new technology. Don't forget that one of the oldest technologies in the world are chairs and tables. And so I'm physically rearranging, you know, very, very mature and known technology. And of course, you know, it's all very incremental business in general because the restaurant business and all the models and all the technologies used are very well known. But nonetheless, uh, there are innovative things I can do, like the arrangement of these tables into a particular uh, thought about the operations um, uh, research that we've done, let's say. So operations research is, you know, revealing uh, new ways to create algorithms that will, processing algorithms that will give higher yields. So, um, again, even something as, you know, in a, in a layperson sense, a restaurant business, changing something, innovating, getting a slightly a greater margin in revenue would be considered to be not particularly innovative, but we're trying to show you here that indeed um, it is still, um, uh, you can still view this with our innovation model as long as you generalize um, what, we're, what we've been talking about. So, uh, of course, we're a little bit more familiar with disruptive uh, technologies and techn uh, disruptive innovation. Um, the uh, classic example is the uh, microprocessor. Here we're just showing the cover of a book about the guy over here, uh, Bob Noyce. And he's the, um, uh, Bob Noyce was one of the early guys in the industry and um, had, um, uh, started in Shockley Semiconductor. So this is uh, Bob Noyce. He was an MIT PhD and, um, you know, took a flying uh, opportunity here, you know, at that time to work for a small company in California uh, that was um, for a very famous man, William Shockley, who came from Bell Labs and, and is credited with one of the people behind the thinking behind uh, the discovery of the modern transistor. And uh, so Bob Noyce worked for his company, and then eight of them realized that it wasn't going to go anywhere, but they had enough work that they formed Fairchild Semiconductor. And then from Fairchild, as they made and sold transistors, discrete transistors, they then uh, got research funding from the government to pursue integrated circuits. And then, of course, when they refined that, they jumped out of uh, him and Gordon Moore founded Intel Corporation. But uh, just to give you an idea, the microprocessor, while they were at Intel, kind of was arising and uh, the markets weren't known. And, um, and so they really had to keep market application space wide open. In fact, uh, some of the, in the beginning of the innovation cycle, they didn't really know that the personal computer would be the application that would make it take off. And that's because, of course, in parallel, the uh, personal computer uh, was uh, developing. And that's an important thing here, which is that uh, we'll show you later in the final um, innovation model, we're trying to have you understand that uh, market implementation and technology are changing as you progress. And so there could be changes in the other areas that um, are all of a sudden making your choices about particular technologies um, and market and implementation that, that um, change the outcome and change the path of innovation. And indeed, that was the case with the microprocessor. But of course, the microprocessor is very disruptive, and once it started going, it really changed the way we are, and that's an example of a fundamental uh, innovation. So I hope that uh, what we were talking about, that we've demonstrated the elements are, are generic, but let's uh, talk about this, um, make sure that, that you understand this completely. So I think the easier one to understand is that market application is generic. That's that's you know, pretty, pretty good. So even though we, we have broken down the pen application 
and show the different markets. I think that to most students and um, observers of, of these lectures that um, you can see how uh, market application isn't a, ge a generic concept that basically, um, yeah, we might be talking about the universe of applica uh, market applications for the pen, but uh, in, in a very generic way, any innovation you know, has a uh, potential spectrum of, of market application. So I think that one's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we've made the definition of technology com um, having both old and new technology and as trivial as the restaurant algorithm for you place tables, we've made the technology a generic description. This is probably the most difficult one for most people because um, the current culture and the paradigm that we've been in in the uh, information age paradigm has made people think of technology and affiliate only with new technology and high technology. And it's very important here, especially when you're not in a innovation paradigm. Uh, but in general, it's, in, if you're going to think about innovation, it's very important to realize that technology is generic term for physical things you combine to address a particular market application. When I say physical, you know, it doesn't have to be a physical object. It can be a uh, algorithm, right? A mathematical algorithm, like we're talking about. And just to um, uh, kind of uh, um, bring you, you, you know, home to that, I wanted to show you this um, other example shown here as soon as I did the primitive way to erase. Um, you know, here's an example of, uh, again, a technology element that is very clearly different uh, from a normal restaurant innovation. So compare the other restaurant that I had where I was using the most incremental thing, changing uh, the arrangement of tables, let's say. Here, we've opened up the risk and opened up the number of possibilities by saying, hey, uh, we could put a restaurant underwater as long as we have the technology in which to uh, construct a restaurant like this. And so here, you know, you would probably in passing say that this is a more innovative restaurant. Now, the, clearly there's a, a bunch of uh, different old and new technologies used in uh, this um, uh, uh, in this uh, innovative restaurant. You could argue that they're all known. It's possible because, I mean, I, I don't know for a fact if the engineering of the um, shape of the restaurant here in this uh, hemisphere and other technologies could be new for all I know. But the point is, is that clearly, clearly they're using new technologies to try to converge on some new um, application space uh, in the restaurant business. So hopefully through that you can see that the term technology, the way we're using it is also generic and that's very important for generalizing innovation as opposed to having the term innovation be kind of a just rough random word describing improvement or an idea or something. And then I think through the last example you could see that implementation is generic as well because, um, oops, sorry. Um, that, um, uh, you know, whether it's the restaurant examples that I gave you, both the higher tech one underwater or the one, um, uh, the more trivial one, which is rearranging the tables, or whether we're talking about TSMC in the earlier example in this class where, um, you know, you're changing the structure of the industry by uh, disaggregating a vertical supply chain, uh, really, um, hopefully across the different restaurant examples and the semiconductor example, you can see that the term implementation is generic. And in particular, um, getting back to a little bit about the this thinking here, hardware versus software versus process, as well as kind of um, thinking that implementation is always for physical objects because whether it's the restaurant or the um, semiconductor TSMC example, we are talking about, you know, physical, moving physical things through a, a different, um, you know, uh, factories or what have you. But in the case of software, you should keep in, in mind again that implementation is the same. For example, 
uh, in software. Uh, you have to have uh, production, you have to have distribution, uh, and you have to have business models. And so again, hopefully with the definitions we've used here, the market application, obviously there's a particular segment of the market that would want the particular software that, that you're making. In terms of technology, it's the not the physical, it's uh, all sorts of uh, um, algorithms and code that are in the software. And in particular, implementation um, is also um, generic as we've been describing it. And a great example is Microsoft. So in the case of Microsoft, um, you probably know the story of Paul Allen and Bill Gates forming Microsoft as they were playing with early microcomputers. However, what you probably don't know is that uh, very early on they started seeing that as different computers came on the market, uh, they could write code, you know, Visual Basic was their first language, for different platforms. And of course, if you're, you know, two guys basically doing this, it doesn't take too long to figure out, hey, um, how do we make a version of Visual Basic that can run on, on many different machines? Now, at this time, you got to remember that software and hardware always went together. So it's much like the TSMC example I mentioned previously, where the early industry, you know, because it's new, everybody in one company has to do all steps in the process. And so, you know, that's that term vertical integration I was using. And it was the same here. People would make computers, they would write the software that goes on them, and then they would um, sell the entire package to somebody. However, um, as you can imagine, if you're developing Visual Basic for different strange computer systems that are appearing, because you know it's a new industry, um, you're, you're having to put a lot of work into adapting to each one. But as you're doing that, you find similarities. And as the, com the microcomputers coming out have more and more similar features, you start to get better at that. Well, what happened was when uh, Microsoft, which was self-funded for quite a long time, uh, you know, on, on revenues and things like that, when it got to a point where um, they had to decide to go to the next level, um, keeping hardware integrated into the company, you know, having to produce computers and software would have been too expensive. And this is, according to history, a classic argument between Paul Allen and Bill Gates, where Paul Allen said, we have to have this machine and the computer and the software we're going to sell together. And looking at the realities of, of financing and the costs and everything else, and plus the experience of, of creating software that will run on different platforms, Bill Gates made the jump that uh, software could be separated from hardware and that it could be a separate platform and that you could build a company just selling software. It didn't have to have hardware. And so much like the TSMC example, it's a case where as the industry grows, it becomes disaggregated. And instead of them always being coupled, we're gonna have, we're gonna have companies that concentrate on hardware and we're gonna have companies that concentrate on software. And, you know, of course they couldn't see this at the time. You know, I'm describing things in hindsight, but the thing that drove it in, in real time for them was this cost of implementation. If you're gonna have the two together and there was a, innovation in thinking that you could separate uh, the software from the hardware and, and run a company just like on that. So again, um, hopefully that example shows you that implementation is quite generic. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about hardware, software, or biomedical, or you know, what have you. The concepts we're developing here are completely generic. So we'll end there, and next time we'll talk about, um, and you can see in the discussion so far, that um, as we were developing discussions for the different elements and as we've discussed the generic nature of them it's of course very difficult not to talk about how one influences the other and so that's the subject of the next lecture lecture 5.2